Richard Waghorn was among the cleverest and most popular of professional mediums, and a never-failing source of consolation to the credulous. That there was fraud, downright unadulterated fraud, mixed up with his remarkable manifestations it would be impossible to deny but it would have been futile not to admit that these manifestations were not wholly fraudulent he had to an extraordinary degree that rare and inexplicable gift of tapping so to speak not only the surface consciousness of those who consulted him but in favourable circumstances their inner or subliminal selves so that it frequently happened that he could speak to an inquirer of something he had completely forgotten which subsequent investigation proved to be authentic so much was perfectly genuine, but he gave, as it were, a false frame to it all by the manner in which he presented these phenomena. He pretended, at his seances, to go into a trance, during which he was controlled sometimes by the spirit of an ancient Egyptian priest, who gave news to the inquirer about some dead friend or relative, sometimes more directly by that dead friend or relative, who spoke through him. As a matter of fact, Waghorn would not be in a trance at all, but perfectly conscious, extracting, as he sat, quiescent and with closed eyes, the knowledge, remembered or even forgotten, that lurked in the mind of his sitter, and bringing it out in the speech of Mentu, the Egyptian control, or of the lost friend or relative about whom inquiry was being made fraudulent also as purporting to come from the intelligence of discarnate spirits were the pieces of information he gave as to the conditions under which those who had passed over still lived and it was here that he chiefly brought consolation to the credulous for he represented the dead as happy and busy and full of spiritual activities this information, to speak frankly, he obtained entirely from his own conscious mind. He made it up. And we cannot really find an excuse for him in the undoubted fact that he sincerely believed in the general truth of all he said when he spoke of the survival of individual personality. Finally, deeply dyed with fraud, and that in crude garish colours, were the spirit wrappings, the playing of musical boxes, the appearance of materialised spirits, the smell of incense that heralded Cardinal Newman, all that bag of conjuring tricks, in fact, which disgraces and makes a laughing stock of the impostors who profess to be able to bring the seen world into connection with the unseen world. But to do Waghorn justice, he did not often employ those crude contrivances, for his telepathic and thought-reading gifts were far more convincing to his sitters. There they sat, while Richard, breathing deeply and moaning in his simulated trance, was the mouthpiece of Mentu, and told them things which, but for his indubitable gift of thought-reading, it was impossible for him to know, or, if the power was not coming through properly, they listened, hardly less thrilled, to spirit wrappings and musical boxes and unverifiable information about the conditions of life where the mortal coil hampers no longer. And then, one day, there occurred an eruption of something wholly unexpected and inexplicable. Brother and sister were dining quietly after a busy but unsatisfactory day when the tinkling summons came from the telephone and Richard found that a loud voice, belonging, so it said, to Mrs. Gardner, wanted to arrange a sitting alone for next day. On some days I can get quite right inside the mind of the sitter, and as you know, bring out the most surprising information. But on other days, 
Today, for instance, and there have been many such lately, there's a mere blank wall in front of me. I shall lose my position if it happens often. Nobody will pay my fees only to hear spirit rappings and generalities. They're better than nothing, said Julia. Very little. They appeared to be just round the corner. Yes, but we never turned the corner. We never got beyond mere thought reading. He got up. I know we didn't, but there always seemed a possibility. The door was ajar. It wasn't locked, and it has never ceased to be ajar. I wish it would, and yet I'm frightened of it. Come, let's play piquet and forget about it all. It was settled that Julia should be present next day when the stranger came for her sitting, in order that a Richard's thought reading was not coming through any better than it had done lately, she should help in the wrappings and the luminous patches and the musical box. Mrs. Gardner was punctual to her appointment, a tall, quiet, well-dressed woman who stated with the perfect frankness her object in wishing for a seance and her views about spirit communication. I should immensely like to believe in spirit communication, she said, such as I am told you are capable of producing, but at present I don't. It is important that the atmosphere should not be one of hostility, said Waghorn in his dreamy professional manner. I bring no hostility, she said. If this visitor took no interest in such things, Waghorn felt that he and his sister had wasted their time in adjusting the electric hammer, made to rap by the pressure of the foot on a switch concealed in the thick rug underneath the table, behind the sliding panel, in stringing across the ceiling the invisible wires on which the luminous globes ran, and in making ready all the auxiliary paraphernalia in case the genuine telepathy was not on tap. Then he began to breathe quickly and in a snorting manner to show that the control was taking possession of him. My brother is going into trance very quickly, said Julia, and there was dead silence. Almost immediately a clear and shining lucidity spread like sunshine after these days of cloud over Waghorn's brain. Every moment he found himself knowing more and more about this complete stranger who sat with hand touching his. He felt his subconscious brain, which had lately lain befogged and imperceptive, sun itself under the brilliant clarity of illumination that had come to it, and in the impressive base in which Mentu was wont to give vent to his revelations, he said, I am here. Mentu is here. He felt the table rocking beneath his hands, which surprised him, since he had exerted no pressure on it, and he supposed that Julia had not understood his signal, and was beginning the conjuring tricks. Instantly she answered back, I wasn't. He paid no more heed to that, though the table continued to oscillate and tip in a very curious manner, for his mind was steeped in this flood of images that impressed themselves on his brain. What shall Mentu tell you today? Someone has come to consult Mentu. She wears a locket round her neck, below her coat, with a piece of black hair and a glass between the gold. He felt a slight jerk from Mrs. Gardner's hand, and in fingertip code, said to Julia, Ask her. Julia whispered across the table, Is that so? Yes, said Mrs. Gardner, and Waghorn heard her take her breath quickly. He just remembered that she was not in mourning, but that made no difference. He knew, not guessing, that Mrs. Gardner wished to know something from the man or woman on whose head that hair once grew, which was contained in the locket that rested unseen below her buttoned jacket. 
Then the next moment he knew also that this was a man's hair. Thereafter the flood of sun and precise mental impressions poured over him in spate of bright waters. She wants to know about the boy whose hair is in the locket. There's a D. I see a D. English, Dennis. Dennis Bristow. He paused a moment and heard Mrs. Gardner whisper, Yes, that is right. Waghorn gave vent to Mentu's jovial laugh. She says it is right, he said. Yes, that is Margaret Bristow who sits here. Margaret wants to know about Dennis. Dennis is coming. He will be here in a moment. Will Queenie speak? Waghorn felt the trembling of her hand. He heard her twice try to speak, but she was unable to control the trembling in her voice. "'Can Dennis speak to me?' she said in a whisper. "'Can he really come here?' Up to this moment Waghorn had been enjoying himself immensely, for after the days in which he had been unable to get into touch with this rare and marvellous gifts of consciousness reading— it was blissful to find his mastery again, and besieged with the images which Margaret Forsyth's contact revealed to him, he had been producing them in Mentu's impressive voice, reveling in his restored powers. Her mind lay open to him like a book. He could read where he liked on pages familiar to her, and on pages which had remained long unturned. Fresh knowledge of Dennis Bristow came into his mind, but he felt that it was not coming from her, but from some other source. The trance that he had often simulated had invaded him, and he knew nothing more. He came to himself again with the feeling that he had been recalled from some vast distance. I will go straight home she said. Mrs. Forsyth would not hear of his attempting to move just yet, and Julia, having taken her to the door, returned to her brother. And I couldn't understand you at all. I remember thinking you were rocking the table, and I told you not to. Yes, but I wasn't rocking it. I was vexed because Mrs. Gardner, Mrs. Forsyth, had said she didn't want that sort of thing, and I was reading her as I never read any one before. Then she asked if Dennis could really come, and at that moment something began to take possession of me. Did you do either of those, or did they really happen? Julia stared at him for a moment in silence. I did neither of those, she said, but they happened. That's all I know until I came to, leaning over the table and bathed in perspiration. Go on. The light grew, and then faded again to a glimmer, she said. And then suddenly you began to talk in a different voice. It wasn't meant to any longer. Then it and she had a long talk. It must have lasted half an hour. They reminded each other how Dennis had come to live with her and her husband on their father's death. All this was correct, and I thought I never heard you mind reading so clearly and quickly. You hardly paused at all. Julia was silent a moment. Dick, don't you really know what followed? Mrs. Forsyth asked for a test, something that was not known to her, and had never been known to her, and you gave it instantly. You laughed, Dennis laughed, the voice that spoke laughed and told her to look behind the row of books beside the bed in the room that was still known as Dennis's room, and she would find tucked away a little cardboard box with a gold safety pin set with a pearl. He had bought it for her birthday present, and had hidden it there till the day came. What made you say all that? I didn't know I tell you. I didn't know I said it. You said— Julia paused again. All that you tell me I said when I was in a trance never came out of Mrs. Forsyth's mind. It wasn't there. She didn't know about the pearl pin. She had never known it. 
Presently the tinkling summons came, and with an eager curiosity, below which lurked that fear of the unknown, the dim, mysterious land into which all human creatures pass across the closed frontier, he went to hear what news awaited him. Trunk call, said the operator, and he listened. Soon the voice came through. Mr. Waghorn. But later in the day, private information came to Waghorn that Forsyth Hall, near Epping, had been completely wrecked. No lives, luckily, were lost, for the house was empty. Thank you for watching this video. Please like, share, and subscribe to the channel to see the latest videos. Thank you.